Well, listen, welcome everybody to this evening's Marketing Kind Exchange. Really delighted to have you all here, especially as I believe it's the hottest day of the year. So thank you for dragging us. It might not feel like that for everybody, but certainly in some parts it is. Um, my name is Claire Kennedy and I'm a founding member of Marketing Kind. Um, I'm also a consultant working in sustainability and social impact. So when Paul and Anna asked me to get involved with hosting tonight's um, session, I was really excited and was very keen to bring in the guests I've got today to have what well, I think will be a really lively and engaging discussion. Before we just get into the discussion, just want to give a brief introduction to Marketing Kind, because I know there's a few people on here tonight who are guests of us as a community. Um, Marketing Kind is a great community of business leaders, marketeers and change makers who basically view a lot of the world's problems as really marketing problems in disguise and look at how can we help to solve the problems of society and the world through our abilities and capabilities as marketeers. So we come together to support each other to become more conscious leaders, but also to use our expertise to support good causes. And we're going to hear tonight from Leeds Paratier Football Club, one of those good causes that we're looking to support. So hopefully everyone will have a chance to get involved with them on one of our Coffee with the Causes, which will be happening later on this month. And we also work hard to sort of seek to understand and to influence the stories and issues that drive the society within which we live, which is a great introduction to this evening's theme, which is all about the power of diversity and how businesses and brands can play their part in creating a society that truly values difference. Now we've got a chat box, a Q&A box even um, on the webinar. So during the discussion, it'd be great to get some of your questions that come up and we'll come and answer those later on in the session. Um, but firstly, I'm absolutely thrilled to introduce the panel we've got to, um, for this evening. Uh, when I was starting to plan this, um, this webinar, Paul's advice to me was to be bold and reach out to my sort of wish list of guests. And I'm absolutely delighted to say I followed his advice and I got the three people I really wanted to have and I didn't even need to go to number four or five. So I was thrilled that they all said yes. Um, so joining us tonight, we've got Jeffrey Arthur who is the founder of The Urban Journal, a media company with a focus on amplifying emerging voices, helping organisations to engage younger, more diverse audiences through data-driven marketing. And I'd encourage you to go and have a look at what they do because they really do some fantastic work. And Jeffrey's also on the advisory board of the Roehampton Law School and on Greenhouse, a leading charity in the UK. Secondly, we've got Amy, Amy Messi, who is a diversity, inclusion and change consultant who's worked with some incredible clients um, from Barclays, the National Theatre, Snapchat, Adidas, Selfridges, and has worked across the globe. So it's got a huge amount of expertise. Um, and Amy has also co-founded Become, which is um, a social enterprise to help women of colour to fulfil their potential. And last, but by no means least, I'm delighted to introduce tonight Simon Fanshaw, who is somebody probably who's got the most extraordinarily diverse career of anybody I've ever, ever met, from a Perrier Award winning um, comedian to co-founder of the LGBT charity Stonewall. He's a TV presenter, newspaper columnist, um, and has advised government on equalities, economic regeneration and the arts. And he now works for and co-runs um, an organisation, Diversity by Design. So helping organisations to use diversity as a catalyst for change and for driving positive change in the, in the organisation that they operate. Sam has also written a book recently, The Power of Difference, which is great read. And I think we've managed to bag a discount for everybody on the webinar. So I'll send details over that out later. So well done, Simon. Um, so yeah, so we're just going to have a, a general discussion. And then, as I said, any questions would be great to come into the Q&A box. So first off, just to kick off, I think it would be just really useful to, to get a bit of your views on what diversity is, what it means to you, and, and you know, frankly, why businesses should bother looking at you know, the diversity of the society around us. Why is it important to businesses? So please do kick off whoever would like to jump in first. Um, okay, I'll be, I'll be the first. I, I think for me, I was sort of in prep for this, thinking about what a good definition would be. And the one that I settled on, was, settled on was recognizing differences, both culturally, socially, you know, economics, et cetera, in an authentic way. I think that's quite simple and gets the message of what yeah. diversity is to me. It's about recognizing those differences and then doing it authentically, not sort of yeah. um, fictionally or, or, or doing it in a fad way, but just doing it authentically. Yeah. No, absolutely. 
Nice. I definitely agree. <laughs> and for me, I put something similar. I kind of just wanted to really unpack what I thought about it. You know, diversity, you rarely hear it mentioned on its own. I always, anyway, in my uh, field of work, hear it mentioned alongside inclusion. And that's the kind of DNI buzzword that we've come to know. But I think it's about people who both look differently and or think differently. And I think that cognitive diversity is really, really important to a business and is something that is still uh, overlooked when we're looking at things, you know, companies are looking at quotas and they're looking at how can they diversify their workforce. Cognitive diversity is not seen as, as important as demographic diversity. Yeah. Um, and of course they work hand in hand, but I think it's that, that, that nuance is to be acknowledged. Um, and I think in terms of why it's important to uh, a business, I think, you know, as a business leader, it's important to make sure you're, you're diversifying your teams in order to gain uh, that insight from a diverse range of perspectives then, uh, which obviously leads to more creativity, uh, more innovation as a business, um, and obviously down the line equals more profits at the end of the day. So I think when appealing to business leaders, you have to look at the, the moral case and the business case for diversity and inclusion. Um, and of course, a big part of that is about future-proofing your business. Um, you know, appealing to that ever more socially minded uh, talent base of, of Gen Z as they get into the world of, of work. Yeah, and so I mean that picks up on something in your book, I think, doesn't it, about those sort of three reasons for why diversity is so important. Yes, I think it's worth just thinking about in what context we're talking about diversity. I mean, in the world, in a country, uh, diversity is a given uh, as a result of uh, immigration, population shifts, uh, trade routes, you know, whatever it is, populations move, cities grow, they, they change. That's in the absolute nature of the way in which populations interact and we interact as human beings. So in the sort of, the, you know, the world, it's a given. It's, it's not a special thing, it's just a given. I think the question then is, what does that mean for businesses and what does it mean in the context of an organization? So I would say that diversity really has purpose and traction when a business is clear about what it's trying to do, whether it's selling services, whether it's developing product, whatever it's doing, it's clear about what it's doing. So it's got some common goals and that's true at a big level, it's true at a department team level. And once you have that sense of a common goal, then I would define diversity really as the, uh, there's the right combination of difference to achieve that common goal. The reason I say it in that way is that there are two elements to this. One is that we are, we are about uh, destroying the deficits that happen. In other words, there are certain groups of people who don't have access and don't have to opportunity in, up and across organizations. And we need to tear them down because actually, as an exercise I sometimes do in a, in, a, in a conference or something, I say to people, turn to your neighbor, look them full in the eye and say, this is as far as you're going in your career. And it always gets kind of terrible nervous laughter. It's like I've thrown in, like I've thrown an electric fire into a bath of eels. Everybody goes, oh, like this. Because you can't say it. It's a hideous thing to say to somebody. And that, but we are doing that to groups of people. So on the one hand, you know, we've got a job to do about opening up opportunity and access and removing barriers. But I think that what then happens is once you've got that talent flowing, for me, the definition of diversity is the right combination of difference to enable the company to do what it's trying to do or the team to do what it's trying to do and the essence of that really which is a reflection of what both of you said but the essence of that is the ability within those teams and departments for people to bring what they can to the business so it, it's not who you are it's what you bring through who you are to that common endeavor and it's the idea that everybody can contribute differently so that's a, the authenticity point if you mm. like and they do it in such a way that there's a purpose to it. So it doesn't sort of sit in isolation. So I'd sort of subdivide it in that way. Yeah. There's the big world. There's the question of opportunity and, and ambition and how we make sure everybody gets access to that. And then there's what happens when that talent is flowing and then how you combine it. Yeah, yeah. but I, I think that's one of the challenges as well, isn't it? Because going from the tick box of we need to have diverse people in the organisation to why, and it's that common goal. And until that common goal is appreciated, 
CEOs say to me the that. whole time, they say, oh, you know, we need more women. And I always say to them, well, let's pop out in the high street and just get six assaulted, shall we? <laughs> you know, because it's like, it's like, what do you mean more women? They don't, yeah. they don't come as a job lot, you know. It turns out they're different, you know, surprise, surprise. So until you can answer the question about what a different balance between men and women will bring to what you're trying to do, once you can answer that, then we know what we're looking for. At least we've got a better guide. I, I really like your point there about diversity and inclusion being sort of uh, integral to the business strategy and the business mission. Um, that is what it is. It's not a, a separate department. It shouldn't just be HR. It should be embedded in every aspect of the organization for many reasons, of course, uh, but namely because it's, it's something that will help you to achieve those business goals. Um, it's not a distraction um, or, you know, to invest in. It's something that we absolutely should have ingrained in our business. It's also quite an interesting idea, isn't it? People talk about diversity as if it's something new. Mm. Well, actually, when you manage people, I mean, you know, I, I'm always like, my husband always says to me, you'd be a terrible manager. And I oh, thanks a lot, love. You know, do you remember the till death to his part, the honor, you know, all that bit. But he's kind of right. I'm, I'm not a manager type. I'm a let's go over there type. Um, but man I really admire managers, and the reason I really admire them is that they have worked out how to inspire and motivate the different people in their teams, and you need to do that differently. So managing difference, I mean, that is kind of just good management, isn't it, really? So it feels to me like the notion of diversity is kind of built into the human condition. I mean, the fact that we are different is pretty much all we've got in common. So to me, that's, what, that's why it sits so centrally. Yeah, and I think just to follow on from, from Amy's point, I think the point about investing in diversity now is we're, we're, we're at a stage where you either invest or as a company, you eventually die. And I think that's because there's been such a massive cultural awareness and shift in how important genuine diversity is, that if you are no longer sort of up to scratch with the need to sort of invest in diversity, invest in your people and treat them well, young people certainly aren't going to work for you. They're not going to buy from you or use your services. So the consequences of not investing in diversity is incredibly dire, um, I think, for companies you know, in this modern day and age. If you think of something like, I, was, I mean, I'm involved with something called Powerful Women, which bright observers will notice I am neither, but stick with me. They, um, so Powerful Women is about, the, you know, about ambition and opportunities for women in the energy sector. One of the things that's really intriguing is if you look at the energy transition that we're going through. So you can see it all over. There was a big piece of the octopus guy who in the Sunday Times magazine, last week, you know, it's everywhere. This idea that actually, you know, it, 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 BP, Shell, that the, the energy companies now, they're not, et cetera. We, we know this, we can see it. You know, the re Ukraine situation absolutely demonstrates that we've got to find some way that political freedom is linked in some way to our dependency on gas and oil. So. If that transitions to be successful, actually a lot of it will be uh, in the way in which the energy industry or the sector skills itself differently. So up to now, it's been very male dominated and quite sort of quite a dirty industry and it's absolutely changing. So if you think of picking up on, 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 on your notion, Jeffrey, you know, if you don't therefore think about the transition in terms of the changing nature of the skills that you need in that sector, then you're simply not going to even get to the edge of the mosquito net of the energy transition. You're not even going to be on the corners of it, are you? You have to do exactly that. And that's why I think it's important that we think of it as a talent strategy. Yeah. And I think it is moving there, but it's moving beyond this tick box, you know, talent. It's not a talent strategy. It's been a talent quarter. And it's getting to that, to your point about why are you, why are you bringing in diverse people? It's not just so that you can um, show people that you're, you're ticking the boxes, you're actually doing it for a reason. Um, well, I think that's so all important. all the right things too, you know, every single yeah. statement on, of a British company, they all begin in the light of Me Too, after George Floyd's murder, I mean, that's the current fad, but there were all sorts of other fads before that. Yeah. And you think, shut up about that. What you should be saying is, I mean, those things are important, that's not my point. My point is, um, we're selling pizza, I don't know, widgets, we're developing whatever we're developing, you know, new means of communication. Because of that, this is what's happening in our workforce, this is what's happening in our talent needs, and therefore, or this is what's happening in our markets, and therefore, you know, I just think people need to stop virtue signaling. I mean, it helps yes. to start the conversation, but it just doesn't get you anywhere. It's all about me, 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 come and work for us, we're so wonderful. Well, frankly, saying it doesn't help, it doesn't do it, yeah. you know? 
don't want to be cynical. Well, I do want to be cynical. <laughs> Saying it doesn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> And I think that's the, you know, that whole point about what it can do for your market, because actually as a group of marketeers, what's also really interesting is how companies are optimising or not the diversity of their consumer base, their customer base. Mm -hmm. um, because I think there are, there are some, you know, companies that are doing that very well, and there are some companies that are probably absolutely missing the mark, and then there's some that are probably just totally so blind to it. Okay, expand on that. So who is doing it well, and why do you think they're doing it well? Who are, and also, Jeffrey, I mean, who's understanding the way in which markets are changing, spending habits are changing across generations, and who's therefore constructing a different kind of talent strategy, and therefore, because it's, I mean, it is about opportunity, but it's also about drawing on experience, isn't it? So who's doing it well, and what is it that they're doing well? I think for me, the, the best brand that has sort of catch on to this is Nike. I think Nike is by far clear of everyone else, not only in, in the way they target their customers, the way they communicate to them, and also the way they recruit talent. If I'm you're so young... glad you say Nike, because you say, I'm so old, I think it's Nike. <laughs> I'm, I'm, not, I'm not the granddad who says to his grandchildren, here's a pair of Nike sneakers. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I, I think you for that. Nike, Nike has moved from the realm of just being a brand that we buy shoes, you know, tops from, to actually a cultural voice. And people actually actively look or listen to what Nike has to say on really important subjects. And I think it all comes back to the bottom line of, are you doing it authentically? And what are the steps you're taking afterwards? And I think that's what sets them apart from everyone else is here's what we're doing. We're going to partner with the leading voices of our target audience that people care about. And we're going to, we're going to measure it and we're going to tell you how we're doing those things. The um, Colin Kaepernick being a prime example of how Nike took a position, spoke to their target audience, took constructive steps and have been with that man for, I think, three or four years now, their partnership is going. Um, and if you look at, if you look at more importantly, how they segment their marketing for different markets, how they do different marketing for London than they do for New York, than they do for Los Angeles, than they do for Germany, you can understand how a, gl a global brand is sort of able to feel more locally and more sort of community. How much do you know about what, the, the, do you know about the internal dialogue? Of the well, I do, I'd love to though. Yeah, because that, somebody should write the book. Um, yeah. Jeffrey, if you could, by next year. <laughs> exactly. But that would be, because, because there is this, there's a certain cynicism, isn't it, the idea of saying, oh, this is a kind of marketing ploy. <laughs> Your point is that actually it's not a marketing ploy. It's, it, your phrase is we're a cultural voice and an authentic cultural voice. So I think it's really interesting to know what was the motivation, what were the steps that led them to being authentic? How did they create that authenticity? And did it come from an internal diversity? Did it come from an awareness of an, you know, what, oh God, I wonder. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think for me, just to one point, before, I think for me, it's, it's about partnering with people on the ground who their target audience follow, respect and listen to. So just to give you an example, they recently did a campaign with um, Arsenal called um, All White, where Arsenal wore an all white kit for one game and it was about stopping knife crime. And the way they communicated what they were doing afterwards, along with Adidas, was really, really important because it's like, here's an example of what we're doing. Here's the results that are coming from it, and here's how you can follow our progress. So I think both added as a Nike in that respect, have been able to partner with people on the ground, as opposed to just having a bunch of really senior marketers sit in a boardroom and come up with ideas and just sort of fire those out. I think it's more about on the ground, on the communities, which is important. There's a really good book called, which, uh, which um, written by Amy C. Edmondson called The Fearless Organization. And if I can, I mean, it's the second best book, if I can say, that's been made <laughs> today. Um, but it, it's got a really interesting example in there of a company that buys engineering companies or manufacturing type companies. And there's this wonderful example where they, they tried to start standardizing the processes to make them more efficient. And they kept on trying to standardize the design of the factories and they kept on, or the warehouses, and they kept on getting it wrong. And they had marketed, they had all sorts of people, architects, all sorts of people came in and did it. And then they did something really sensible. They went and talked to the people who drove the forklifts. And it turned out that no one knew the width of the forklift. <laughs> and it, it, yeah. it's a really simple example. But her point is that the fearless organisation is where everybody is expected to speak up and expected mm -hmm. to contribute. So that authenticity also comes, and your point, uh, 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 Amy, about inclusion, is that inclusion has got to be inclusion it can't be well it, you know we've got to speak like this think like this behave like this or we'll exclude you it's actually got to mean that we've got to have arguments we've got to realize that we've got to have conflicts and they're actually healthy conflict is Absolutely. 
Yes, you've got to, that, that boldness and that braveness has to extend uh, internally, yes, but also beyond the organization. That um, chutzpah, <laughs> for lack of a better word, you, you need that. And I think um, immediately when you asked that, Simon, I thought of Nike and I thought of Adidas. Um, I don't know if you see most recently Adidas did that um, sports bar campaign showing a range of different breasts, um, and showing how the right sports bar is so important and there are people who've had double mastectomies and a whole range of different kind of um, breasts on show basically. Yeah. Um, and that was bold. It's, it's nudity, oh my goodness. Um, but it's, and it's already been banned um, by the Advertising Standards Agency. Um, it had 26 complaints, I think it was, and it was banned because of that. Um, now that's, <laughs> that's an example of being bold and being brave where arguably it hasn't, it's come off too strong maybe. But I think you have to keep pushing the envelope and going further. Um, but that's, it's interesting that the, the examples we're thinking of are in sports um, and in my head instantly, sport and fashion came in, into mind as brands that are optimizing those opportunities. I think there are a few brands outside of that that I can really think of. Um, and if, they, if there are there, they're focusing on, on gender, um, more recently on race uh, and, and sexuality, but you can still like rarely see a brand that shows you know, a woman over 50 or um, a person in a wheelchair or you know, people with uh, neurodiversities. Um, and you know, there's a reason those campaigns still make headlines. They still win awards because they're bold and they're new. Yeah. And with sexual orientation, I am so bored. But I mean, I practically don't go into. If anybody shop, if any shop has a you know a rainbow flag in it, I sort of think, well, I'm not going in there. Do you yeah. know what I mean? I've always, I'm always kind of reversed it now because it just feels tokenistic to the nth degree. You know? yes. we've, got a, we've got a float at Pride, and we've got a LGBT other nonsense letters group. Yes, along um, with the drag queen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's that's kind of enough. And you think, well, actually, I did a I did a conversation once. Um, <laughs> the Lesbian and Gay Network and Insurance asked me to come and talk, and that was fine. That was very interesting. Off I toddled to Lloyd's of London. They had a lovely thing, you know, nice kind of place, good wine, all good. And um, and I started out by saying, you know, I'm not really terribly convinced that there's it really matters whether lesbians and gays are involved in insurance. It's a bit of a moment you can imagine. And I said, look, tell me why. And it didn't take them very long to get into talking about uh, the advent of gay marriage, what that meant to domestic partnerships, how actually what gay people and lesbians wanted out of insurance was now something that was different from what it was saying. You know, they just started talking about stuff. And of course, as soon as they made that connection, it became a quite interesting conversation. But as long as it was all about, oh, you know, I'm gay is glamorous, which by the way, I can introduce you to gays that are simply so <laughs> dull, you would just die. <laughs> Uh, as there are straights that are glamorous and dull as well. Uh, you know, it could become a more interesting conversation. So it wasn't just a cynical thing. It was a genuine thing to say, well, actually, what, if we, if your, your question, if we play a role in the world mm -hmm. as businesses, what does that, what is that role? Yeah. And I think that's an, it, it's in, I think that's one of the challenges for brands and businesses at the moment is how do they navigate that spectrum between the lazy badge and the consumer activism and brand activism? Because, you know, I, I, uh, one of the things you know it'd be interesting to understand is what what role should brands play do you know do they have to have a do they have to have a view on everything or could they choose what they have a view on and for the things they don't have a view on actually is it fine to badge it or do they just ignore it so you know where, where do you think how do you think brands could or should navigate that complexity I think for me it's it's about who is your target audience and what do they care about. I think once you answer those two questions, it becomes a much more easier conversation about okay, how far do we go? Again, sorry to come back to Nike, but I, I do think they're a really good example of knowing their target audience incredibly well and saying, well, what do they care about? What topics are they sort of circulating on social media, TikTok, etc.? And how can we go in there and, and give them a voice to give them a platform to showcase that voice? So I think whatever brand you are, there are certain conversations or certain things that you have to do to signal at least that you're sort of a 21st century brand um and that sometimes comes across as just symbolism but i think that's a very base level and then the next comes of okay who is my target audience who's buying my product who do i want to buy my product and how exactly do they behave what space do they hang around in what do they care about and once you answer those questions you get a, it becomes sort of a very obvious and simple about what to say and what not to say um, I think it's more about sort of pushing a lot on understanding the behaviours, the passions of your target audience and everything flows from there. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I just think it's, it's, I think there's so much pressure on brands now to have the answers to everything and to support, you know, the, 
the communities that are highlighted in a particular moment, um, whether that's black lives or um, the lives of hungry school children or Ukrainian lives, there are moments obviously where certain people's needs uh, have to be focused on and supported, but that's, that's a, you know, a lot of different causes to have full awareness and understanding and support for as a brand. And I think that's really complex because that pressure comes from everywhere. It comes internally from your employees. It comes from your, your customers. It comes from your board um, and just the, the general public. Um, so I think what I found, and this was abused a lot as a sort of term, but I think there is a real power in saying we are learning we're absorbing, we are on a journey of understanding, um, and as always, we'll continue to support and respect people from all backgrounds. Um, what that can't then be is just a way to buy time and hope it all goes away and you can forget about it. That has to be time spent learning and developing a strategy for action. Um, it can't just be like what you were saying, Simon, about you know the pride thing, just you know supporting the LGBTQ plus community in that one month and that's your tidy little moment for them. It's got to be sense. And understanding too that, you know, LGBTQIA plus uh, is meaningless to most people. It's not the way anybody speaks. It's not a coherent group. So one of the interesting things, and I mean, I asked both of you about um, uh, BAME, you know, I mean, there's a huge argument about that. And there's a thing actually, I just printed out because I love it too, but there was a conference in 2019, September 2020, this group of people called hashtag BAME over. And it was lovely. It said that we reject BAME. The term unhelpfully blends ethnicity, geography, nationality, and in doing so erases our identity and reduces us to other. And their term of reference begins, we want, do not want to be grouped into meaningless collective term or reduced to acronyms. We are African diaspora people. We're Southeast and Southeast Asian diaspora people. We are, sorry, we're Southeast and Southeast Asian diaspora people. We are Middle East and North African people. We are ethnically diverse. We have people who experience racism. And what I love about that is it, 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 it challenges the breadth of the mm. category, but it also reminds you there is a value in the category in relation to racism. So, you know, what is, or in the same with homophobia, you know, I would say to people, you know, when the face, when the fist sits your face, they're not asking your pronoun. Do you know what I mean? It's basically because you're a poof, you know? I mean, prejudice is pretty stupid, so that's valid. But when marketeers and businesses come to look at the breadth and the real diversity of people, they, they, need, they need to demonstrate your point is that they understand that those are not just great big homogenous wadges of population, that they, are, that, they, that they really understand that and they guess that and they're not patronizing you to say, oh, you know, hello, Asian people, would you like some curry? you know, at its most sort of bonkersly cliche, you know, or to us lot, it's always like, would you like glitter? <laughs> yeah. yeah I, I think that follows on to Amy's point about, I, I think that the reason why, especially sort of um, the people under the age of 30 seem to think of fashion sports brands as the lead, because they tend to be really good at avoiding, the, I, I can't remember a fashion sports brand using the term BAME, but I can, I can give examples of a lot of corporate banks and law firms, etc., using that term. And I think it's because, they've become so, so comfortable in sort of walking the tightrope and not wanting to offend anyone that they sort of group everyone together. And in return, you actually don't engage anyone and you rather alienate a lot of people. So I think corporate companies have a lot of work to do about how do I communicate with my target audience? What do my clients care about? What do my workers care about? And then doing a lot more work and just getting to the point. And I think with corporate sort of companies that's the big ticket we just get to the point instead of just walking around and avoiding the elephant in the room which sports and fashion brands tend to do really well now i understand the point about because of the way that you know corporate companies function it's, it's a lot more difficult i can see that point but i think you can be a bit bolder and more direct without going outlandish in the way that fashion and sort of sports companies do and actually, it's really important to understand, I mean, I wouldn't have written a book called The Power of Difference if I didn't think this, but it really is important to understand difference. In other words, you know, the point you make there is that there's this terrible tendency in, in sort of in and around diversity to go for the lowest common denominator. So, for instance, I went to a conference the other day at a university, I won't say which, but UCL, and um, the, the, it was really annoying because they said you would be a vegetarian lunch and I wrote some sarcastic cling back and went oh hurrah quinoa and then I said any chance of any meat and this person went back and said we're a very diverse community and then started describing organized religion and then basically said that actually vegetarian food was the least offensive food and I showed this to my husband who's a Nigerian Muslim so you know so I say to people I don't just work in diversity 
and married it. But um, he said, well, just because I don't eat bacon, it doesn't mean to say you aren't supposed to eat bacon. That, my religion doesn't tell me that I've got to stop you eating bacon. It tells me not that I don't eat bacon, you know. And this terrible notion that we've got to not offend anybody and lowest common yeah. denominator. And what was what, what you're raising there, I think, uh, uh, Jeffrey, is really interesting is that why do businesses feel that it's dangerous, not just to wade unknowingly to controversy, but to say, you know, the fantastic thing about our business or our people or our markets is they don't agree about stuff. They share things, yes. but actually we celebrate the difference and the diversity and the fact that we all argue, <laughs> you know, why yeah. do businesses find that difficult to brand them, to brand difference and diversity really in that way? Because that would be authentic. Yeah, I, I think I think corporate companies in particular have made name, and they feel like it's 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 been it served them well to sort of always sit on the fence. But I think the big shift now is that you either get off the fence and engage with important issues, or you simply die and lose money as a company. I think that is where it's heading in the next sort of 10, 20 years. Um, and they're gonna have to do a lot of work, number one, on communicating directly, and also understanding the issues that they should get involved in and how they should get involved in those issues. I wonder I whether that whole them. point, sorry, carry on, Simon. Well, I was only gonna ask whether, you know, we, 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 we've talked before and we, we, we explored the idea of whether or not companies are on safer branding ground if they are in a situation where there's lack of controversy but you mentioned colin kaepernick and and and, and nike um or nike as a parent somebody says it's nike in america and nike in britain so that lets me off the hook of being an old <laughs> fart but um but the thing about taking the knee and colin kaepernick is that actually it wasn't uncontroversial actually it was terrifically controversial with certain groups of people wasn't it and yet they turned they made it very positive they didn't they didn't duck the controversy they didn't go oh it's so dangerous they kind of made it positive, didn't they? So is that part of the deal, is that it's it's actually getting all the positives out of the difference and the controversy? Is that how you do it? Exactly, yeah. And I think as a result, Nike has profited massively because if you're a young kid and, the, you know, and you're thinking of getting some NFL, NFL gear, who are you going to go to? Nike, because they identify and sort of signal everything that you care about. If you're a young Muslim woman now and you want to try some sport, who are you going to go to? Nike, because you see yourself on the advert and you think this is a brand that cares about me. So I think it's so authentic to the point where we feel and identify that if I want something, I'm going to go to this brand. So there's also the profit um, gain that they are reaping in, I think. Yes. But you can, you can sort of, for a brand to speak to a, a diverse topic, I don't think they necessarily have to have an opinion on it. I don't think they, I don't think they do. Nike, Nike haven't kind of, <laughs> on everything anyway. I just think action is really, really important. Don't get me wrong, but representation matters. And in Nike, just showing that they have created, taken the time to create a product that speaks to Muslim women, where you can wear a hijab that you can do exercise in and it's comfortable to wear and it's breathable and all this sort of stuff. I think that speaks volumes. Mm. Um, I don't think they have to have an opinion on every single thing and every single law that comes into being against or for uh, Muslim women. Um, and that, of course, reflects in people's, there's this notion that companies have values, you know, and so they say things like, I'm not going to get this exactly right, but there was a company in America whose values were something like integrity, communication, uh, you know, uh, directness. Anyway, it turned out to be Enron. You know, I mean, it was completely bonkers. And there were two things wrong with it. One is that they were criminals, so that was one thing. <laughs> and they weren't living up to them. But the other thing was that they were positing this notion that companies have a single set of values. And actually, if you're a business that's, say, mm -hmm. running a heritage business and you're constantly innovating, I mean, arguably, the, those two tensions in your company are precisely at, not at war, but they're tensions. Yeah. And so your values should reflect that tension. So instead of saying we've got this one set of values, I always say to companies, no, the top value is that you're a place where people can voice their opinions and views and make their input. That's the, that's the number one value. Difference is your number one value. And then you can, because there's no point saying, oh, you know, we're a company with integrity. Well, if you're not, you know, you should be in court. Uh, yeah. you know, why say it? 
I think to give an example, the watch industry is one that is wrestling with that theory of, you know, the watch as in, as with, in yeah, with, with the introduction of smartwatches, you know, uh, young people now have lots of different alternatives. So you know, people like Rolex, you know, Tankawa, et cetera, are now thinking, well, how do we innovate? We've we've always marketed ourselves as this great traditional brand where, you know, th- there's a person in a white lab coat knitted together, you know, different components of a watch. But all of a sudden, these tech companies are pulling in massive amounts of um, money making tech watches. So how do you differentiate ourselves whilst keeping our tradition so all of a sudden your, your values are sort of thrown in the air and it's about well how do i innovate without losing my core customer base so i think that's a really good industry to look at when you're thinking about how to wrestle with differences but i think it's the same in, in all of marketing isn't it because marketing has made a lot of money from grouping people with similarities and companies have said it's all about everybody seeing off the same hymn sheet having the same values it's it's are we moving away from the benefit of similarities to the benefit of difference and how do how do companies move along that in the in an authentic and way that is you know has integrity rather than just badging it yeah well, there's a terrible illusion isn't there to the idea that choice in the marketplace is 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 a sign of your individual style because on the one hand that's what people do constantly they test their style but then there's this kind of idea, isn't there, that marketing gives, which is that if you wear Calvin Klein underwear, I'm as for a certain generation, you young people, we used to think it was dead chic, you know. But <laughs> if you wore Calvin Klein underwear, that was supposedly a, yeah. a, a sign of your individual style. Whereas actually it was the sign of, you know, 40 million people's individual style. In other words, it, it actually wasn't a sign of individual style at all. So there's a curious thing here, isn't there, about the idea that choice in the market is individual, whereas actually it's not. And marketeers, presumably, I'm not a marketeer, but presumably you're always in that slightly odd thing of selling that illusion, which is partly by association. And you're saying it can be good when you're doing it interestingly, authentically, which which Klein, Klein, Klein clearly did do. Ralph, I mean, Ralph Lauren did it. I mean, he's invented a form of Englishness in America. Just, mm. it, it's a complete construction. I mean, it's the most extraordinary thing. He's a Brooklyn Jew, you know, I and mean, it's so brilliant as a conceit, you know. Um, so I find, so as marketeers, how do you satisfy your integrity if actually what you're really doing is trying to sell that illusion? Because I think marketing really, to me, boils down to knowing your target audience, what do they care about and how do I give them that? I think for me, that is a very simple process of whether you're delivering a product or a service. It's about who exactly is my target audience? What do they care about? How do they behave? Or who do I want them to be? And then given, and I think Raphael does that so brilliantly is, you know, I want my target audience to be people who want the finer things in life, who want to live a particular lifestyle, who want to look a certain way and who have certain activities they do on the weekend. I'm going to create clothes that sort of fit that lifestyle and they lap up and they buy it. The same thing with Prada, the same thing with, you know, Dior, the same thing with people like BMW, Mercedes is, who is my target audience? What do they care about? What's important to them? And how do I give them that product or service that they're going to engage with? And I think once you sort of answer those questions, everything sort of flows from that. I think sometimes we have a habit of making things a lot more complicated than they are. Um, but it was boils down to that simple process of who am I trying to reach or who do I want to reach? What do they care about? How do I give them that? Yes, uh, yeah. I agree totally that this is where your market research is unbelievably important, particularly when you're trying to show diverse or underrepresented people's communities for the first time. And it's not... You know, I've had this where I've been the only person of colour on a marketing team and they've relied on me to speak for the African community, the West Indian community. You know, it's it's so broad. You cannot just rely on, you know, one person to speak for an entire community. Of course you can't. It's about reaching out to those wider communities to, to, to learn about them. And I think where it gets, you know, more interesting and more accurate is when you start to appreciate the intersectional traits you know, so so yes, they're black, uh, but they're also a woman. They're heterosexual. They're high income, and as soon as you start engaging with people as multifaceted, that's when you're going to be able to create a much more nuanced pictures of your consumers and of your audience. And I think the real power to maximize every single campaign you have is telling universal stories with diverse people. So yes, for example, you're showing an African family uh, around the dinner table having an authentic African meal, but whatever problem they're facing or the, the solution that your product or service is offering is a universal message. 
it's not just appealing to African people. Yeah. And I think that that's what all marketers should yeah. aspire to, telling universal stories with diverse people. And that's why I think, Amy, like a big percent of any marketing budget should be talking directly to the people that you're trying to reach. A good example is, uh, I think it's a few years ago, the Home Office was trying to come out and combat um, knife crime. And they decided that the best marketing strategy was to go to chicken shops and turn the, the, the sort of um, chicken boxes into black with words on on them to discourage young people from, from engaging in knife crime. Now, I don't know who they spoke, spoke to, what research they did, but that is so far off what any average person who is involved in that world would say, well, that's a solution. Why don't you stick some words on a chicken box um, and it will change the way I live. And I think that's a direct example of who are you trying to reach? What do they care about? And how can I give it that? And doing it completely and totally wrong. Um, that's the one example that came to mind when we were talking about that. One of the, one of the interesting things too that I encounter the whole time, and I'm thinking about, you know, who did you speak to and how are you, how are you reaching that difference, if you like, is that often what people do is they interpret diversity in a corporate context as being, you'll hear this, people say this the whole time, we want to be representative of our customers, we want to be representative of our community and whatever. The difficulty is, in a world that's so highly diverse, is that that's actually arithmetically just not possible. So take it at its most extreme. We've done some work with call centres, you know, 999, you know, the, the 111 and all that, um, fire, ambulance, police, you know, et cetera. Uh, so what they do is they go, you know, it must be a, a, a representative of our community. And you go, okay, that's fine. But actually the chances of, you know, the gay Muslim man being on the end of the phone when the gay Muslim person who wants to be a patient, house on fire, whatever, is infinite. I mean, it, you know, he's likely to do that as win the lottery, which by the way, just a hint here on the lottery is that it's only, you only mildly increase your chances of winning the lottery by actually buying a ticket. So just remember that next time you do it, the odds are so bad. But in other words, you know, the chances of that happening are, are, are kind of incredibly slim. So what does that mean, representative community? So I think what it means, and one of the people who's really fantastic was a woman called Catherine Phillips, who very tragically died two years ago, one of the great researchers on diversity. And she ran a series of experiments that looked at the extent to which the diversity in the group, whatever it was, once valued, was capable of doing what you're talking about, which is going out and thinking about who you talk to, in other words, perceiving diversity in the, in the outside world. So it's not that you're representative, because you can't be that, but what you can do is create a circumstance in which the questions are raised, and therefore, who do you talk to? Where do you go and look? Yeah. So, and then, crucially, in a call centre context, but this is true of a marketing context or any team context, how do you then share that perspective around the team if it's not constantly with each other? So I spend a lot of time saying to people, don't try and be representative. Try and get within the, the what I call, I mean, it's psychological safety. I call it safe spaces for disagreement, not from disagreement. So you create that space in which people speak up and they value difference enough to look outside at, and, and think about where the differences might be. Because if you think of the 999 services, people perceive them, use them and access them in very different ways. So young people do in one way, there are ethnic divisions on that, there are men, women, divisions, there are all sorts of stuff. So you've got to be alert to the differences outside without being representative inside, but nonetheless having sufficient representation. Yes, but, that, but that, I love that, that safety of speech. Um, it's so important. That is the inclusion part of this whole puzzle. But I think if I'm wrong, I just want to give a little, this might be completely wrong, but I think it was Catherine Phillips who created that study where she had, um, she divided people into, into groups and half of the number of groups, say there were groups of five, um, so there were four groups of five in a side and they were all um, friends. So you'd have um, four people in a group and they would all be friends. And then the other groups, they would be three friends and a stranger. And then what she said that she gave them some murder mysteries. Oh, see. it's fantastic. That's right. And so each group, that's exactly right. So each group, everybody had the same information, but each person had yes. one bit of information that no one else had. Yes, yes. That was great fun. And, yeah. and, the and the result, you're, sorry, I'm telling your story. The result, <laughs> the result of it was that the mixed groups asked more questions and they reached the solution A, more often, B, uh, 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 and quicker. Yes. And, it, and to an insane percentage, I think it was the groups of the three friends and a stranger got it right 74% of the time. That's exactly right. It just, whereas the groups of, of four friends got it right 52% of the time or something, or 49. So it was, it was hugely 
uh, d disparate there, but that's so interesting. Yeah, and she studied juries as well and looked at mixed juries. I mean, she was looking at ethnicity particularly, but black and white juries operate very differently from all black and all white juries. And she did another, there was another experiment she did, which she gave exactly the same script. This is, I find this fascinating. She gave exactly the same script to mixed groups of people and sing, so this is ethnicity again, white groups of people, black groups of people, and a mixed white black group of people. She got, eventually she got actors to play out this in exactly the same way. They replicated the way it was played out with the scripts and they got people to watch it. And everybody thought that the mixed group had more arguments. Wow. And in fact, they were saying exactly the same thing. So it's a perception yeah. about conflict in diversity, which is actually an illusion. It, it's quite peculiar. So it comes from an expectation of conflict rather than a kind of valuing of difference and, an, and a kind of using it as an asset, if you like. So, yeah. yeah, she's brilliant. She was such a wonderful, I mean, I never met her. I wish I had done, but her, her writing is, is really terrific. We're really geeking out here on diversity. <laughs> Catherine, so Catherine W. Phillips. Everyone look it up, look it up. So okay. if, I'm just thinking, you know, if, if people are sitting there in a marketing team and a business team and they're thinking that I'm, I'm, I've got blind spots here, but I don't know what they are, you know, what would be your sort of biggest piece of advice to people to really make sure they are being authentic and taking the opportunities that the diverse marketplace offers? Yeah, I think that as soon as you are assuming something about someone, you are, you're in danger of falling into those stereotypes that we see time and time again. So yeah. like you're saying, as soon as you're asking one person's view to inform on an entire community, you're at risk of that stereotyping. Um, and in marketing, there's there's definitely this benefit to grouping people together because that's what marketing does, you know, especially in digital, you're literally grouping audiences together based on, you know, one shared trait that they have, um, like where they live or their interests. But I think it's about, asking yourself, what questions are you asking? You know, what groupings are you making and why? Um, do you need, and I've seen this with the brand, do you need to group all of the black people together? You know, maybe if, you, if you're selling an Afro hair product or something, you know, equally as, as niche, that might make sense. But just like you wouldn't group all white people together, mm -hmm. ask yourself, why do you need to group together this particular group of people? It should make good marketing sense to do so. Um, and in, in terms of, um, Claire, you're saying about brands being culturally sensitive to that. I mean, once you've figured out those consumer groups and your audience personas, I think it's about firstly identifying the stereotypes that exist, literally write them down so you understand them so that you can then eliminate those stereotypes. Um, understanding why you want to represent whoever you're, rep you're showcasing. Is, that, is there an authentic reason why you want to do that? Um, and then finally, um, as Jeffrey was saying, it's making sure that you then speak to that community to understand their needs and their wants. And that might sound like an impossible thing to do, to speak to an entire community. Um, but there are, there are loads of ways to do this. There's a, there are companies that can help you. Uh, the yeah. Diversity Standards Collective literally will give you access to a number of different underrepresented communities you can speak to. So once you've got that knowledge, you're able to be more accurate and more culturally sensitive. Yeah. I second every word of what Amy said. I have not a single thing to add. <laughs> what is interesting, that's great. What is interesting, I think, too, about stereotypes is that they do get weaponized against us, but they also have a germ of truth in them. You know, it, I mean, it would be daft to say there are no camp gay men. It would be, I mean, it would just be stupid. I mean, you know, part of the experience of being a gay man is the gap between the who you are and the who you th people think you are. That The gap is the fun bit, that's where camp exists. So we know that happens. And even I, who think, you know, I'm terribly, terribly passing, everybody says I'm quite camp. So who knows? But the point is that, that those stereotypes do have some value. So there's a sense in which you are, you're, 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 the key thing is not to weaponize them, I think, as in a negative way, you know, but it's to value them. And the other thing I say about, about this thing, how do you question what you, you know, you don't know what you don't know. So how do you question your own assumptions? Mm. And the truth of it is that assumptions are a useful way of negotiating our way through life. So we have to have a starting point. But when people say to me, oh, we went to a party the other night, we met this, this person, oh, so much in common. I just think, how dull. 
<laughs> because actually it's much more fun to ask what you don't know because that's the discovery, that's the learning. And so I think there are a couple of things about that. One is that it's crucial that in when we think about um, inclusion, that we don't impose a set of rules, which if people somehow break, they get socially punished, isolated yeah. and excluded. Because that is the opposite of inclusion and that is in danger of happening a lot at the moment. And secondly, is that, that you know, what you don't do is you don't impose like that, you allow people to discover. So we have to find ways of allowing ourselves to make, quotes mistakes. In other words, we will make assumptions about each other and we just have to find ways of correcting ourselves and each other when that happens. Yes. But, and but... and, and that's, that is true psychological safety. It's when there's no um, sanction for getting it, quotes wrong. Now, there will be moments when you get it sufficiently wrong that somebody's really upset. Well, we, we just have to deal with that. You know, being up, there's no, there's no guarantees about not being upset in the world. It's not a human right. It doesn't, you can't create a space that's safe from disagreement or offence. You just can't. We're human beings. So we find, I think that the, that the discovery and how you understand those markets and where you go and look and why you do, how you don't put words on it. I love this thing that, you know, there's the person with the knife cutting <laughs> the chicken thing open with the knife and thinking, oh, I'll eat this with the knife. And they Ooh, oh, handy. Oh, <laughs> shouldn't stab anyone tonight then. You know, you think, well, that was a bit dim, wasn't it? Whoever did that. But it's the curiosity to go and find out and the bravery to hear what it is you're going to hear. And those are culturally important inside companies. And, we've, and it spreads. If you start stopping, stop people saying one thing or, in, or imposing an ideology on them in one respect, that will spread into your conversations about innovation and communication in a negative way. Yeah. Sorry, that was a bit of a soapbox. I apologize. I'll get back no, to that. No, no, it was really interesting. It just made me think of, you know, when I do my assessments with brands, um, my, my clients, I initially go in um, all these surveys and it's an assessment phase. And one of the words that I, I repeatedly see come up in that moment is when I ask, what does diversity and inclusion mean to you? Uh, is the word comfortable <laughs> and it's that everyone is comfortable and I just think that is um, fundamentally incorrect <laughs> because and that's fine that's that's why I'm here and other people are here to, to, to learn from each other and to, to unpack this but if you're comfortable you're you're not challenging and you need to challenge you absolutely need to if you've got all this diversity in a room and um, cognitive diversity demographic diversity and it's really kind of uh, diverse if, if people don't feel comfortable, there's that word again, to be able to speak, don't feel included in the conversation, you're not reaping the rewards of well, that. that's right. The safety comes from it feeling safe to be dangerous. Right, exactly. It to doesn't quit. come from the opposite. It, exactly. It, I mean, Theatre is my example. I mean, I, sorry if this is a ghastly sort of middle class thing, but I love the big plays, the uh, Arthur Millers, the Ibsens, the, that take these big issues that are really difficult and dangerous. And you sit in a space where you feel safe to explore this stuff because it's on the stage. And so you can go to the depths of your emotion, your father, father's death, your, I don't know what, and yet you're in a place that's somehow supporting you to do that. And you can literally leave it behind in a way and take out of it what you want and somehow we have to replicate that at work yeah uh, one example of a, of a very corporate person that i can give who i think does it quite well is jamie diamond of jp morgan the ceo and i've watched a few talks with him where he talks very very directly about um diversity and he's not he's not sort of scared to get it wrong but in so doing he comes off as incredibly authentic and he gives quite good examples of how he encourages his organization and everyone, his executives, et cetera, to treat people with diverse. There's one, one example he gives of when, when some of the male executives walk into a meeting with other female executives and then they sort of plan trips around golfing or particular sports and activities. And he uses that and sort of branches out and talks about well, how corporate companies can be a bit more authentic about diversity. So I think Jamie Diamond is a good example of you sort of sitting on the fence and thinking, I'm a bank or I'm a law firm, I'm an accountant, how do I sort of touch on this issue? Yeah. I know, Claire, when we did stuff about your project, it was about, oh, how can we just get to yeah. the point and be a lot more direct in, in the language yeah. that we use, but yeah. Well, I think you're right, and I think especially as, you know, for people that are, you know, white, heterosexual, middle-aged, <laughs> middle-class men at the top of a core organisation, actually that, the, com the, the confidence in standing, in saying things and the confidence in getting things wrong 
I think is really important because otherwise they won't people won't learn and they'll shy away and not grab that you know, I was at, um, grab the nettle. Uh, I was at one of those rather I find them rather annoying sort of gay conference event things. You know, they're always on the thirtieth floor of some building, Canary Wharf, and they're full of people who've got smart men who've got smart suits and then twice why and then going on about how uncomfortable it is to be gay at work. You know, shut up. And this <laughs> This bloke stood up at the front, he was one of the partners, and he was introducing me and I was chairing a session, and he stood up and he talked about his alcoholism and the consequent depression. And I said to him, when he'd finished, I said, that is about a million times braver mm. than anything I've heard all day, because at that stage, that is an, that's a taboo subject, you know? And I just felt that, and I then talked to some people who worked with him, and that's his kind of, his atmosphere. And it has an extraordinary effect on people. And he was, you know, married, living in Kensington, three children, all that yeah. gay, you know, as you'd expect. And it was just brilliant. Um, and you talk about authenticity. There was a sense in which he was prepared to open up in that way. And I yeah. do genuinely think that everybody, you don't have to be an alcoholic. You, don't, you could just be like, you think you're Mr. Normal or Mrs. Normal. You'll have a story. You'll have yeah. something you can bring. You'll have the stuff in your life that, that makes you who you are, whether it's the yeah. parents, the relationship you had with your siblings, the fact that you moved, I don't know, whatever it might be. So it's bringing that, bringing your story, whatever it is. And there's, nobody's not got a story. Yeah. You know? I'm people just going to interrupt now. They say, that, they, people that... say, you know, I'm a, somebody says to me, oh, I'm, I'm a boring heterosexual. And I went, no, those are two separate things. <laughs> 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 Nothing boring about gonna, being heterosexual. It's fine. I was just going to say, on the subject of stories, we're going to have to take a break now to get Paul Gorman in from Leeds Parish Football Club because he's got a great story to tell us, um, and he's going to introduce his um, charity organisation. Um, and this is for our charity, um, Coffee with a Cause, which we run at Marketing Kind, where members get the opportunity to come on and work on a charity's cause. So. Um, Paul, I think you can miraculously appear on the, on, the, on the screen and we'll hear a bit from Paul and then we'll come back to Q&A because there's a lot of questions in the, in the chat. So, Paul, over to you. It'd be great to hear about your organisation and, and how we can help as a marketing kind organisation. Uh, That's wonderful. Have we moved into evening yet or is it still afternoon? Oh, I think you've got probably a minute till you can say good evening. But OK, so I'd six o'clock is the... Is the, is the uh... The break-off time, is it? Um, I'll, you'll have worked out already. My name is Paul Gorman, and um, I'm the current head coach and also the club secretary for Leeds Power Chair Football Club. Um, I wanted to just start off with a quick quote, really, from Mark Twain, which says, in 20 years from now, we'll regret the things we didn't do more than the things that we do. And we're just coming as a club to our 10th anniversary. So we've achieved an incredible amount in... 10 years so one of the things I want to do from you guys is how do we do the next 10 years so our club started in the back end of October 2012 as a result of the um, home Olympic Games when a group of parents came together and decided they wanted to give their children all of whom had got um, profound impairments um, and wanted to give them the opportunity to play the beautiful game so they were looking for ways to do that and came up and found the sport of power chair football. And most people usually ask the question at this point, well, what's power chair football? What's it like? What, what does it feel like? Well, the truth of the matter is I haven't got a clue what it feels like to play power chair football because I've never played it. Um, I coach. Uh, that's my job. I do the coaching. But if you're able to take yourself back to the first time you were allowed to go to the the fair, or as we call it up north, the feast, and you're allowed to go on your own with your pals. And if you were to roll all the rides, such as bumper cars, the waltzes and the speedway, roll all those things in together as one, that'll give you an idea of what it's like to play pulp chair football. It's fast. There's a lot of spinning goes on. It's quick. It gets the heart rate going. It's a really, really popular sport among people with disabilities. So it's played indoors and it's a 4v4 game. It's probably the most inclusive sport around because there are no restrictions around age and gender. So we can have a player as young as four, male, playing with a 50, 60-year-old female. So 
that's one of the real benefits of the sport, which makes it really, really inclusive. Um, as a club, we've got a strap line, which is unlocking everybody's potential through power chair football. And we don't just mean the players. We're talking about all our parents and all the people that are involved. Everybody at the club is a volunteer. Everybody is generally a parent first and a carer second, and then the roles that it takes to run a football club. The effects that we have upon the people that use um, the facilities that we provide is immense. It gets people out of the house. It gets them socialising. Parents and players both learn new skills. There's a huge networking opportunity. We get quite a lot of youngsters that have come into the sport um, whose parents have got no experience whatsoever. And it's wonderful to sit in the hall and watch the kids engage in football and then parents sitting together and networking and learning all kinds of things about each other. Primarily the sport was set up to meet the needs of young men with muscular dystrophy. Uh, muscular dystrophy has been the big sponsor for the sport over the years. And over the years, it's developed now to the point where we've got not just MD, but the diversity of the sport means we've got more people with um, cerebral palsy, brittle bone. Um, we've had a real growth recently of um, youngsters with spina bifida. Um, spinal injuries, which is the category that I fall into. So we've got quite a, a diverse range of, of impairments. We've got people who, like myself, use a manual chair and, and are fairly dexterous and able to get around to players who actually use switching gear um, in their headrests to be able to move their chairs or they've got special adaptations where they may only be able to use uh, the movement of one foot and they can move their chair with the one foot or they'll use a chin rest um, under the chin to actually move the chair with the chin. So what we're looking for as a football club is, is to build a legacy. Um, we want to become the largest. We want to become the best. We want to be the best that we can possibly as a football club. We're one of only two clubs that cover the whole of Yorkshire, uh, the largest county in the country, and yet there are only two, two teams. There are only two clubs. What we're looking to do is to develop our m and our media and marketing, as people refer to it at the club. And we want to empower more of our members with skills. We want, the, we want our club to be more sustainable. Um, we want to be able to show our sport to as many people and engage as many people as possible. That's not just from a sponsorship or a corporate partnership, but just generally get the sport out there. So we want to increase our social media. We want to, we've got a podcast and we want to know how we can make that work better. We've got a website, but it's a standard website and our publicity is pretty much standard publicity. So we're looking for people that may be able to offer their wisdom, um, their time, uh, their expertise. But ideally what we want to be able to do is to get people to mentor members within the club and to help them be able to pass those skills on and then to cascade those skills down again inside from people. So, as I say, 20 years on, we'll regret what we haven't done uh, more than what we did do. So, as we hit our 10-year anniversary this October, we want to take this opportunity now more than ever to really be able to get out there and show what it is that we can and can't do. That's me wrapped up. Um, I don't know if anybody's got any questions and if they do, who wants to go first? <laughs> well, I'd just like to thank you, Paul, for coming on and telling no your problem. story about the, the club. And I'm, I, I've already seen in the chat, there's quite a lot of people who really wanted to get involved. So if you do want to get involved, there is um, the Coffee with the Causes on May the 27th. So if you want to get involved, get in touch with Anna at Marketing Kind. If you're not a Marketing Kind member, there's a 30 day free trial at the moment to sign up. And if you sign up to that, you can then have the opportunity to work with Paul and his team on what I think would be a really interesting and satisfying Coffee with a Cause, because it sounds like there's a huge opportunity to really expand what you do, the amazing work you do. So um, thank you, Paul. And if everyone getting back in touch with Anna, if they're interested in joining. Brilliant. Thank you, Paul. Um, right, we'll now move on to questions. So Simon, Amy and Jeffrey, if you're able to come back on. Look at this magic. Um, 
Right, we've got some great questions. So let me start with one that I think is is, is a fantastic question. I'd be interested to get your views from Richard um, Byron. Are hashtags and SEO dragging us away from authentic diversity? That's a good question. Uh, that's a really good question. Um, yes and no. I think yes and no. I think yes in the respects that, um, especially if you're trying to do some social media marketing, they can help you get to your sort of target audience very quickly. Um, knowing the fact that it can be a bit of a lazy way if you don't do the work beforehand in terms of segmenting and understanding your audiences and going about it but it's a 50 50 answer i've been doing a lot of research and thinking about this so i was like okay let me jump in straight away i think there's definitely a benefit i think that brands are able to you know draw attention to these issues on such a global scale um and if they're, if they're getting a positive message out there that's reaching a really wide range of people, then I think that's a really important awareness piece. Um, I think probably the drawbacks there are that it has to be soft because you're speaking to some people who, you know, have maybe just been introduced to this cause or, or this community for the first time. So obviously to bring consumers with them, there has to be this element of keeping it simple and playing it safe. Um, but I think brands that are doing it well, and, and there's a reason they're doing this, this is why marketing is so powerful. Uh, there's a lot of campaigns which show underrepresented communities as, um, and they're really emotional, these campaigns. They're really, really kind of heart-wrenching. They're really powerful because as every marketer knows, the easiest way to change minds is to change people's hearts. Um, Obviously you can reach far, you can reach you know, people that you couldn't reach otherwise. So it's a great way of reaching people. I think the downsides, are that in, in a way it comes back to this notion of authenticity. You've got to be clear about what you're doing and you've not got to be thrown off course by a few, very few loud voices. In the same way that a few people uh, making very noisy protests on a campus or somewhere uh, about a view they do not like, brands can be pathetically um, uh, uh, sort of um, uh, uh, knee bending. Now that's the wrong word because we're, we're taking a knee is a good thing. They can be pathetically sort of wishy-washy in responding to, um, you know, one or two things. They just get bend, oh my God, I'm the And they issue these awful groveling apologies for something which, had they thought about it carefully, I mean, Monsoon did it recently where a male-bodied person wanted to use the female changing room. They have separate sex changing rooms in Monsoon. And the person who was on duty at Monsoon said, actually, uh, that's not going to be possible. And they then went on social media and said that it was disgraceful and they'd been, you know, this, that and the other. And Monsoon immediately, and they said they were trying on a prom dress, and Monsoon immediately issued this ludicrous apology, bending over backwards and offering them a, a free prom dress. Turned out this person was 27 or something. It was a stunt. They weren't going to a prom. They were trying to test whether or not this would happen. And, you know, so total, I mean, complete inauthenticity in the response, complete failure to think about, hang on a second, do we understand the issues here? What is the issue about having separate female and male changing rooms? And how are we going to deal with people who, for whatever reason, have transitioned or whatever, how we, no thought of that at all. No thought, and just a pathetic sort of craving, caving into one loud voice. So I, I just go back to this thing that the trouble with social media at the moment is that it doesn't seem to me that brands know how to resist it. And they don't know how to develop the, the authentic message in the first place. And it's particularly true around racism and gender uh, 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 orientation at the moment. It, those two things, brands are so unclear about how, what they think that they're, mis they're just messing up the whole time. They're failing to understand that there are different opinions, that actually, you know, there's a huge range of opinions around the role of race in life, and there's a huge role of opinions around, you know, the immutability of sex and so on and so forth. And brands have either got to do it properly or not do it at all, in my view. And they're, they're, they're damaging people by doing it, by messing up like this. So I think that there's got to be authenticity, but there's got to, they've actually got to bother to think it through. Which, which ties into a lot of the things that we've talked about that whole yeah. that it's taking the time to have the thought process rather than the knee-jerk reaction i think you know is, is and just funny. sorry one last thing to say is that there was this idea wasn't it do you remember when um your man who invented nudge oh what's his name um 
oh, I can't remember his marriage to the wonderful woman who was the UN ambassador under Obama. I can't remember his name. Uh, he used to talk about the daily me. Do you remember that? The idea that people were so curating what information they received. You know, they were only hearing their own views. Life has moved on, actually. Research has moved on. Actually, that's not necessarily the case. People do hear lots of opposing views, but they don't change anybody's minds. They drive people further into their sectarian bubbles, if you like. Mm -hmm. And so we've got these, they're, they're, they're echo chambers and they, they build resistance um, uh, in the first place. So again, I think one's got to, you know, brands have got to understand how, the dangers of how social media can work. And to be honest, you know, there's a wonderful comic I like called Michael Che, who does the weekend, the news updates on Saturday Night Live. And he's got, he said, once said this, he said, to, to go on Twitter's like the, everybody you hate having your phone number. And I just think that's such a great, such a great gag, you know. But, but they are, half of the people on Twitter are people you wouldn't sit next door to in the pub, aren't they? No, absolutely. See, you know, as a brand, you're a few more confident, I think. Here's another good one, actually, which I think, Simon, you'll quite enjoy as well, is from Paul. Where is the place for playfulness in our diversity and inclusion efforts? <laughs> Hasn't it all got a bit serious? If anybody talks to me any longer about your microaggressions and intersectionality and privilege, I mean, people are using language in this, this in this space. We have to say space. They use it. Sorry, what they do is the language piece in this space. You know, they use. People are talking in ways nobody talks like that except them. <laughs> you know. So number one is we need to return it to the human. We need to return it to this, this powerfully wonderful idea about the difference between us is where we experience our humanity. The second thing is we really have to accept that jokes are not jokes unless they're warm. So don't use the excuse, oh, it was just a joke, because if it was really offensive, well, it wasn't a very good joke, frankly. Um, you, in other words, be warm with people, but but curiosity and playfulness lie at the heart of this. And you have to deal with the consequences when your curiosity upsets people. And if it does, well, you know, suck it up, deal with it, explore further, understand why they're upset, you know? Yeah, and I, th I think as well, there's a, there's, there's a way that you can reflect people's realities back on them in such a kind of real, authentic way that can definitely provide humor. I think that's a really, you know, as soon as people see themselves um, and can, they can then laugh at themselves, right? And th th that is a danger of stereotypes and that is, there's a definitely a fine balance to be drawn there. But I think reflect people how they are and they will be seen and they will find it either funny or warm or whatever you want them to feel in that moment. Um, and that, that breeds loyalty to a brand. Really the one that annoys me is when people say, oh, you know, when did you first decide you were gay? And I always say, when did you first decide you weren't? Yeah, yeah. Because you know, it's a fun answer. I'm not really offended. I'm slightly bored by the question. But they don't. It's a starter. <laughs> you know, it's a it's an opener. So yeah, don't kind of take offence by it. And I know that you know if you're visibly, if you're disabled, if you're black, if you're female. So in other words, if you're visibly, you know, different from men, white men. You know, you experience sexism, racism, whatever. You experience that every day, all day. And I get that. I get that. So sometimes you just don't have the energy. You don't just don't have the energy to be jolly about it. And I understand that or to deal with it. But on the other hand, as a whole, we've got to find a way that's humane in dealing with each other in that way. I think that the, the point that sort of underlines both what Simon and Amy said is be authentic. If you're, if you're authentic enough, there's very little room for you to be worried about in the whole world. As long as you're authentic and you're not ignorant i think you should be okay yeah but there, there are things where i agree i agree to some extent but I, I would just only make the challenge i mean i don't know i mean we'd have to define exactly what authentic means but people can be authentically <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah but not ignorant and that ghastly yeah. phrase you know bring your whole self to work and we work with one manager who's so awful and i eventually said to this person you've really got to think about how you're treating other people and she said no no that's just me i'm just bringing my whole self to work i said well stop <laughs> You know, so so one has to be a bit careful in the sense that I think authenticity in the sense of a sort of genuineness, in other words, real curiosity. Yeah. Then if you constantly say to someone who's not white, where do you come from? And then they go Birmingham. And you go, yeah, but where do you come from? That's that's starting to be insensitive rather than curious, isn't it? So you kind of got to. Yeah. Got to be aware of of yourself yeah. and not just say, well, I've just been me. Well, yeah. stop. 
Yeah. And this is actually to one diversity. of the next questions, which is one of the fears many people have on diversity and inclusion is the fear of getting it wrong. How can people overcome that fear and make a strong start? So it's the opener that we've just said. How, how do you make a strong start? And well, not well, it's it. the most difficult thing for managers is creating this, this atmosphere in which um, it's safe to disagree. And it's safe to have those conflicts and, and the acceptance that they will happen. I mean, on the most extreme level, you know, when there's something ghastly happens to a child or whatever, and somebody always says, you know, that we're going to have an inquiry and make sure this doesn't happen again. And you think, well, that's just a stupid thing to say. It will happen again. I mean, make it happen less often. OK, but it will happen. We will get offended. We will get upset. And the, the really difficult thing for managers is how do you deal with that? And you've kind of got to get a commitment from your gang, your team, your whatever, that you're all prepared to deal with this stuff when it happens, you know? And if somebody's just not nice to other people, we have to deal with that as well, you know? But sometimes when people just get it wrong, well, there's a process to go through. And if you just go, you're a bigot, well, where have we got now? Yeah. Whereas if you say, actually, that upset me, and you say, okay, why? And then you understand it, and you say, oh, I didn't mean it like that. You've also got to listen to the I didn't mean it like that. You've got to listen to both sides. You can't just listen to the offence. You've got to listen to the person who said, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it like that. Yes. Even if you don't accept that that's a reasonable excuse. It's not an excuse, but it's what they thought. And that, that oil boils down to discussion to that inclusive communication that we have and i think when you're fearful of something the last thing you want to do is talk about it and expose it <laughs> and exposure was this fraud and i think all definitely imposter syndrome plays a part in that but i think it, it, it's, you have to keep talking about it if you don't know don't be afraid to ask you know i saw a lot of things during black lives matter on social media saying you know don't come to me for your sort of learning and your understanding like it's not my job to educate you and yes it's not my job to educate you well actually no it is i'm a diversity and inclusion consultant <laughs> <laughs> but your average <laughs> person of color whatever it's not their job to educate you but you can ask ask in that environment in that safe environment in a workspace where you've got your your committee meetings or your whatever and say i don't know about this can you help me i want to learn um, and, and also, um, with what Simon was saying, don't be afraid of the word sorry. You know, sorry can seem so scary, particularly when someone's come at you with a lot of wind in their sails. Um, but it's okay to just say, I'm sorry, and I'm learning. Uh, and I, I think, sorry, I, I think but adding to both those points is about being authentic, but not ignorant. If you authentically get something wrong, no one's going to cut your head off if you're genuinely sort of got it wrong and you just say sorry. But I think, you know, it, it, it's, it's when, to Simon's point about when you ask a black person, for example, are you really from here and they keep poking until they say some other countries or other continent? That's being ignorant, right? That's not being authentically uh, um, sort of probing. So I think it's all about when you authentically get something wrong, no one's going to cut your head off. You know, if someone asks me a question that they don't know an answer to, I'm not going to, you know, bite back, nor is anyone that I know. I think but that's- it is amazing, part. Jeffrey. It's, it is amazing at the moment, though, how much that is now developing as a response to that stuff. And I do worry about the, it's not my job to educate you, or, uh, uh, so for instance, silly example, but, but the taxi drivers. Taxi drivers always, you know, I mean, there are, you know, the, 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 there's the London cabbie, and then in Brighton, where I live, naturally, uh, of course. Um, you know, cabbies seem to come from everywhere. And so I always think, well, oh, there'll be a story here. There might not be, but there might be. So I've spent you know, ages thinking, what's the way of saying? So I often say to, to cabbies, for instance, um, have you lived all your life in Brian? Or, you know, that, that, that would be my question. And then they might say, no, I've been here for 15 years. And you say, oh, fantastic. But, you know, you can say, I think at that point, what brought you here? In other words, what I'm, what I'm trying to do is find a way that's, that's sensitively, in other words, it follow, and this is maybe your point, the authenticity, I'm genuinely following the curiosity because I'm not saying to them you don't belong. I genuinely am interested because they then go, oh, well, what happened was, you know, me and my sister fled Kandahar and, you know, and suddenly, you're, you know, you've only got 10 minutes from the station, but you've got this amazing experience that you can hear. Yeah, exactly. Oh, it is just that, authentically following your curiosity, not probing because you have some assumption that is completely ignorant and you're trying to assert that assumption. But it, what if what if the person who you're genuinely probing or genuinely following your curiosity with treats you as if you're being offensive? 
that's and that's happening a lot these days how dare you do this you you know and people leap to racist or sexist or transphobic or whatever really quickly and somehow how do we stop that overreaction i think that is a long road that society has to go on. obama talks a lot about this um and, and he makes the point to young people in particular about not rushing to be offended and, and you know there are nuances in every situation the world is complex etc i think society has a lot of work to do to get to the point where we're all honest with each other um, i don't think that's solely the role of marketers i was in a show on saturday night and this is a bit of an anecdote but it's quite jolly i went to a fringe show which is always a you know it's crap shoot really <laughs> and it was great the energy was terrific actually and they were trying to satirize work and bits of it were great but they didn't they didn't really have their target set they were spray painting against every target available you know and it was sort of uh, it was one of those sort of hr seminar types it's quite fun it was quite good it was full you know very bright and there was two things one is they used the phrase turf which is i don't know whether you know this but it's it's so-called trans exclusive radical phrase. it's definitely used as an insult and that then this this phrase of don't be a turf don't be a turf don't be a turf was repeated in the song so i booed because I won't stand for it any longer. I think, no, I'm sorry, that is an insult to a certain way of thinking, and I'm not in favour of that, and it can't just be passed over. Boo! I went. Women in front of me just turned, you know, they, shut up, how dare you, stop booing. And then later on, there was a whole song of which was Sex Work is Work. Now, I think that's profoundly offensive. I think that's a real kind of idea that sex work is somehow, oh, you're in your flat, and you need to earn a little bit extra money, and somehow you're performing on camera for that. No. Most sex workers, women who are trafficked, enslaved, you know, to me, that's a highly offensive concept that sex workers work. You may disagree, and that was nonetheless my view. Boo, again. Afterwards, the whole, this group of women turned on me, which was kind of interesting. But the really interesting thing about it was they couldn't bear dissent. My boo was seen as me imposing my view, whereas I was going, no, the whole show is about not being a robot. So, I'm contributing, I'm trying to contribute, I'm simply dissenting from the view. And then this woman, eventually she just went, you're vile. And I said to her, well, I said, I'm, I said, you know, I said, you've only got to experience it tonight. I said, I've got to live with it. <laughs> you know, which was kind of funny because I couldn't think what to do. She was so sort of pissed off. But the point of the story is that there's a dynamic in there, which is really, I think is beginning to replicate itself around work. And I mean, look, I don't care, not worried about me. But that's dangerous when, when people leap to those conclusions too quickly, whereas actually there's a proper discussion to have. Yeah, no, absolutely. I'm going to jump back in with a couple of other questions because um, there's a few more in here. What is your advice for a smaller business with limited resources at the very beginning of their journey in prioritising diversity and inclusion? So we've talked quite a lot about a lot of research, and uh, but you know all these things cost money. So, so where would you advise people with a smaller budget, smaller resources to focus their time? Really good question. I think for me, when it comes to smaller budgets, social media is a really good place to hang out because you get to learn and absorb a lot of what people are talking about. Um, it is a bit time consuming to just read tweets and look at TikToks, etc. But you get a really good pulse on what is going on culturally and also what your target audience cares about. You know, if for example, if your target audience is, is all older, more professional people, then hang around on LinkedIn. You start to see things sort of develop and trends come. If your target audience is younger people, then you know, not quite sit on TikTok all day, but sit on TikTok all day and you will absorb an incredible amount of information um, and, and sort of a pulse on what is going on. So I think that's sort of the initial advice of, of, for small businesses is spend a lot of time on social media to see what is going on. And then once you do that, you can develop personas like Amy was talking about, strategies to say, well, who is my target audience? What do they care about? And how can I give it to them? I yes, hope that's to totally agree um, with everything you said. I think, um, I've worked with a lot of different startups and obviously there's an understanding that there aren't necessarily, unless you're incredibly lucky, there aren't those big budgets and you're not going to be hiring um, a huge diversely you know, diverse team because you simply, you've only got five or 10 people in it. So um, in that situation, a lot of startups think they cannot engage with diversity and inclusion until they're bigger. But I think that, I think that's, that's wrong. I think we're actually in a really, exciting position in that you're able to build in EDI from the get-go, from the very beginning. You know, yes, you'll have to learn faster, you'll have to pick it up a lot quicker, but it's it's a really unique opportunity to actually build that into your business strategy. So it's not something you have to spend a lot of time and money later on to invest in. It's 
integral to your business from the, from the get-go in that business goal. Um, and I think the other thing that I would say is a lot of companies straight away want to come out with all these, um, you know, incredible inclusive marketing campaigns, but start internally and build that action. We've spoken a lot about the kind of action and words today. I think start with that action internally, really kind of nail that, support your internal staff, and then you can go out authentically to communicate externally. It's more expensive to do it later. Sorry, Simon. It's a lot more expensive to do it later. Um, and Amy's price is very cheap. And I think that there are sort of, there are stages, aren't there? So you start off with yourself, your partner, a couple of friends, whatever. so, you know, there's two, three, four of you, whatever. And then there's an interesting moment when you start, well, there's two or three things. I think that one of the first phases is that actually you have to decide whether this is a kind of lifestyle business or whether you're really going for growth or what, you know, whatever it is. So once you've sort of set your direction, that's the moment to which, so say you go from four people, it's the moment between four and eight that I think you, you, what, 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 what you just said, Amy, is absolutely crucial because that's the moment where the danger is that you'll surround yourself with people who are like the people you've already got. So the one bit of advice I would give to you when you start up is, as you say, keep, recruit for difference. Deliberately find people who are going to add difference to the team you've already got. Don't get more mates. So you've got a vision, you know where you want to go. Think about what difference do I need in this group of people to get, to make that vision real. So do it really early on and create, we call it recruiting for difference, it's our sort of process, but, but do recruit for difference and find that, that, that new stuff, you know? And, and uh, because that, you're right, it will, it will pay you so many benefits in the future. Yeah, and I think, to sign up, but when you recruit for difference, they challenge you back. And then they become sort of attached to your company's mission and not to you. Because what you can do when you're recruiting mates is that they, they, they become sort of loyal to you, but you want people who are loyal to your company's mission. And when you recruit for difference, that is a lot more easier to do than it is when you say, hey, I'm struggling here, do you mind sort of chipping in because I've known you for like 20 years. Absolutely. Well, listen, I'm really conscious of time. I think we could probably go on for another another two hours because there's so much to talk about, but we're going to have to close now. But I think we've, it's been a really, really engaging, inspiring, insightful discussion. So I hope everybody's enjoyed it. Simon, Amy, Jeffrey, thank you so much for spending your time with us and for sharing your expertise, your stories. And it's been a lot of fun, um, certainly to host it. So thank you very much for your time. And just as I said, Simon's book, The Power of Difference, um, which actually has a lot of, we've talked a lot about practicality. Oh, Luke can snap. Um, practical actions, there's, you know, there's a lot in there that actually, if you are interested in it, how can we actually get this um, embedded in our company? There's a lot in there. So I'd thoroughly recommend a read. And thank you to everyone else for joining us this evening. It's been great to have you all on board and for all your comments and your questions. It's been really brilliant to have so much um, engagement from the audience. So thank you. Just finally, before we go, just a reminder about Paul's Coffee with a Cause for the Leeds Power Chair um, Wheelchair Charity with a Cause on May the 27th. And then our next um, exchange is on June the 23rd. And that's going to be Jamie Bristow is going to be exploring mindfulness and the climate crisis. So that, again, should be a really interesting and insightful session. So hopefully lots of you can join us for that as well. So thank you very much. Have a wonderful evening and hopefully see you soon on another Marketing Kind event. Thanks, guys. Thank you.